So here we have them, the famous kinematics equations. Different textbooks call these by different names, but kinematics equations is the most common name. I'm going to assume that if you are interested in this topic, you are already familiar with position, velocity, acceleration, and time. There is a lot going on with these that I cannot possibly do justice to in one little video. So I'm going to assume that you already have this stuff under your belt and you're ready to take the next step to put them all together into these formulas to solve problems. In principle, these formulas are pretty straightforward. If you know what value belongs where, you just plug it in and then solve for your unknown quantity. Maybe you have to do a little algebra along the way. But of course, it's usually not quite that easy. In this video, I'm going to address several of the biggest issues that people have with these, including the all-important question of how to decide which equation to use when. And along the way, I'm going to raise a few questions that I'm actually not going to answer. I'm going to defer those to a second video. And when that video is up, there will be a link in the upper right hand corner there. So this video has the most useful stuff. And then the second video will essentially be footnotes. The most important thing to know about these equations is that they require your acceleration to be constant. If the acceleration is not constant, then you have to do something else entirely to solve the problem. Maybe do conservation of energy or something like that. Now, very briefly, let me remind you that this is position as a function of time. And when time is equal to zero, then the position is simply equal to x zero. I'll call this the initial position when t equals zero, and then this will be the final position at some later time. Down here, similar story. Here's velocity as a function of time. When time t is equal to zero, then the velocity is equal to the initial velocity, v0. Now, technically, what I just said about initial and final is not exactly right, but I'll clarify that issue in the next video. Now, the big question is always, how do you choose which equation to use in a given problem? And there is a methodical way to decide that, which I'm about to show you. So I've made a table here that takes inventory of exactly what variable is used in which equation. And the idea is that if someone tells you this, 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 and this, you can use this first equation to calculate that. Or if they tell you this, 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 and this, then you can use all of that to calculate this. As long as you have only one unknown quantity in your equation, you're all set. Now this looks pretty involved, but we can make it simpler by noticing a couple of things. First of all, x0 and x always go together. So you don't really need that x0 column. Now the truth is, about 95% of the time, x0 is just going to be 0 anyway. Now some textbooks, particularly high school textbooks, don't even include x0 at all. And if you erase all of the x zeros, it certainly makes the formulas look simpler, but I don't recommend it because having this always equal to zero is not always convenient. Next up, initial velocity. Notice that all four formulas have the initial velocity. So that doesn't help you to decide which formula to use because it's in all of them. So let's erase this. So now we're starting to see a useful pattern. Out of these four variables, x, v, a, and t, every possible combination of three out of the four is covered by one of these equations. So in a standard problem, they will tell you two variables and then ask you to calculate a third. And once you've sorted out which three variables you're dealing with, then you just look to see which equation matches that. And of course, you're going to need a v0 and maybe an x0. Now there's another variation that's also quite common, which is they ask you for one variable and then they tell you one variable and then the other variable is implied. So for example, a question could ask, if you let something fall from rest, how much time does it take to fall two meters? The question is asking for time. It's telling you the distance, it's gonna fall two meters. So now you need one more variable either the v or the a. Do you know either of those? You should, because the acceleration from gravity is always 9.8 meters per second squared. So in fact, 
you've got three variables, x, a, and t, and you're going to use this first formula right here. And of course, if you fall from rest, that's code for the initial velocity is zero. They could have said, how far does it fall in 10 seconds? And then you would be given the time, you're asked for the distance, again, you know the acceleration, and so you can calculate it that way. Another common variation is they'll give you one variable, they will ask you for one variable, and then you'll have to do a little bit of math to find the third variable. So for example, they might give you a force and a mass, and it's up to you to figure out you can calculate an acceleration and then go from there. Now you should know that there are problems for which this three variable strategy doesn't work, but they are rare. Last time I saw one was a few years ago and it wasn't even in a regular physics class. Now I'd like to address a couple of issues that commonly come up with these formulas. Let's start with this first one. Notice that there's a t and a t squared. If they give you all of these other numbers and ask you to calculate t, you may find yourself with a quadratic equation. And solving a quadratic equation requires the quadratic formula. If you hate the quadratic formula, there is a workaround. If they give you x, x0, v0, and a, you can substitute all of those things right into here to calculate v, and then substitute v into here to find t. Having said that, I recommend that you get comfortable with the quadratic formula, because quadratic equations do pop up here and there in physics class, and usually there won't be a workaround. Another issue commonly happens with this formula right here. See how we have a v squared. What happens when you plug in a bunch of numbers here and you get a negative number on the right side? Well, that's wrong because a square can never be negative. So what do you do? You've got two choices. One is to simply ignore the minus sign Take the square root and hope for the best. And if you do that, you'll get the correct answer about half the time. And if you don't have time to do it the right way because you're in a big hurry to finish a test, then maybe that's what you should do. But if you do have the time, you should make the effort to figure out what went wrong so you can get it right. And the issue is usually with this term right here. Now this thing is squared, so it should be positive, and that's simple enough. If this whole thing turns out to be negative, then that almost certainly means there's a problem here. Either you've got the wrong sign on the acceleration, or you got this stuff backwards. Here's an example of that. So suppose you've got an object. It starts at position x0, and then it falls to position x, because it's accelerating down, like things tend to do. What's the final velocity going to be? Well, if we define down to be plus and up to be minus, then an acceleration that's down will be positive. The displacement will be down, so that's also positive. You'll have the positive times the positive, and that makes a positive, and you're all set. You could make up positive. If that's the case, the acceleration downward will be negative. And the displacement will also be negative. You have a negative times a negative, which makes positive, and you get the same answer. So how you get in trouble with this is where you're not consistent about what's plus and what's minus. People mess that up all the time, and not just with this formula, but with all of them, which means when you first start to do a problem, you need to take a moment to decide for yourself what is your direction for plus and minus. Now, some people insist on always making up positive. But for a problem where something's falling, I recommend down to be positive, because the velocity's down, the displacement's down, the acceleration's down, everything's down. I'd rather have all positive numbers than all negative numbers. Now, when things are going up and then down, you're going to have positives and negatives regardless. And if that's the case, I would probably go with making up positive. And you need to be careful with that, because position can be positive or negative, velocity can be positive or negative, acceleration can be positive or negative. Once again, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. I'll post a link here to that other video when it's ready. 
Also, if you're interested in being tutored online by me personally, I am available. There's a link in the description down below and also in the about page for this channel.